As leaders and as humans, often our greatest strength can be our greatest weakness. And one area that you have to find balance is that you have to be aggressive, but you can't be reckless so that you don't set yourself and your team up for failure. In the last episode, we talked about how George Armstrong Custer led about 650 cavalrymen under the 7th Cavalry out onto the Great Plains of Montana in search of a band of Lakota under the command of Sitting Bull. This was part of a greater campaign called the Great Sioux War of 1876 or the Black Hills War. And this was a war between the U.S. military, namely the 7th Cavalry, and the Lakota Sioux and their Northern Cheyenne allies. These were Native American tribes that were fighting for their traditional way of life and their homeland who did not want to cede their territory to the U.S. government and be forced onto reservations. Sitting Bull was a great Lakota chief and a medicine man, and he led a band of several hundred Lakotas. They refused to sign the treaty, be forced onto reservations, and surrender their traditional way of life. And Sitting Bull had put out the call to other bands of Lakota in Northern Cheyenne and Arapahoes to come and join him. Sitting Bull had assembled a powerful group that were willing to resist the U.S. military campaign to force them onto reservations. Meanwhile, the U.S. military sent out multiple expeditions to try and locate Sitting Bull and his band of Native Americans. As we talked about in the previous episode, Colonel Custer and his men located Sitting Bull and the Native American village. And what he chose to do in his haste to capture the village was to split his forces into multiple groups. As his forces split into multiple groups, they disappeared beyond the far hilltops and couldn't see each other. And so they were unable to actually support each other. Anytime that you split forces and those forces can't see each other, they don't know what each other are doing, they're unable to support each other, that is setting your team up for failure. One of Custer's greatest leadership qualities, his greatest strength was that he was default aggressive. He was proactive, he led from the front, he wasn't afraid to defy orders and lead charges that turned the outcome of battles. And he did that very thing at the Battle of Gettysburg as a Union Cavalry officer in the Civil War. They defeated the Confederate Cavalry charge and ensured the Union victory. At the age of 23, Custer was promoted to the rank of Brigadier General, a very senior leadership position, normally reserved for someone who was much older and much more experienced. Prior to the Battle of Little Bighorn, Custer had achieved victories on the Great Plains against Native American tribes because he was default aggressive. On the morning of June 25th, 1876, Custer scouts locate Sitting Bull's village. And they see a dust cloud coming from what they say is the largest pony herd that they've ever seen. So Custer gets this report from his scouts and now he knows that this Native American village is larger than he had originally anticipated. However, Custer is default aggressive, his greatest quality, and he wants to rush down there and capture this village before they can flee. Custer used the same tactic and was successful eight years prior to this, in 1868, in the Kansas campaign at what was known as the Battle of the Washita, or the Washita Massacre. Custer personally led an attack that punched through a larger group of Native American warriors that outnumbered his cavalry troop, and he was able to capture the village and basically hold the women and children hostage until he could negotiate a surrender of the Native American warriors that outnumbered him. Custer's goal is to maneuver as aggressively as he possibly can, as fast as he can, surround the village, capture Sitting Bull and his Lakota and Cheyenne allies. But while being default aggressive is Custer's greatest strength on the battlefield, it's also his greatest weakness. While it's important to move fast and outmaneuver your opponent, it's also important to mitigate the risk that you can control, to not be reckless, to not just rush into a situation that can lead you to your death or the death of your entire team. Having been successful with this tactic previously, Custer assumed that he would be successful again. This is something military historians call the disease of victory or victory disease. And when you have successes on the battlefield or in the business world or anywhere in life, that can lead to complacency. As you start to overestimate your own tactical abilities and underestimate those of your opponent. This is something that was a major contributor to the battle here. 
When he split up his forces, when he maneuvered aggressively, he didn't properly take a step back and think about what were the risks to his team. How could he mitigate the risks that he could control? And that forced him to split his forces and it forced him to maneuver so fast they got ahead of their supply train and they didn't have the proper ammunition that they needed. It also prevented him from thinking about what the worst case scenario might be. And so what he thought was a village of 800 or so Lakota following Sitting Bull was actually a village of some five to 7,000 Lakota, Cheyenne, and Arapahoes who had banded together. And while Custer had 650 troops under his command, the Native American tribes that he was facing had 1,500 to 2,000 warriors. He was vastly outnumbered. Custer didn't consider that he should wait for reinforcements from other 7th Cavalry units that could help him and boost his numbers to give him a greater advantage. When you study the Battle of Little Bighorn, it's easy to point fingers at Custer and say, look what he did, he was, he was too aggressive, he was reckless, he didn't mitigate the risk to his team. He made bad decisions, and that resulted in 260 of his troopers being wiped out at the Battle of Little Bighorn. But as a combat leader myself, I was forced to make split-second decisions based on incomplete information, just as every leader is in any situation. Whether you're in business, whether you're a first responder, whether you're trying to make decisions for your family, you are not gonna have complete information. You're gonna have to make decisions based on the information that you have. So this is a powerful lesson that we can extract from the Battle of Little Bighorn. You must be default aggressive. You've got to be able to maneuver. You've got to be able to move fast. You've got to be able to outmaneuver your opponent, your competitor in the business world, and make decisions based on the inf complete information that you have. But you can't be reckless. You have to take a step back and think about what are the risks to my team? How can I mitigate the risks that I can control? In order to do that properly, you have to stay detached. You can't get emotionally attached to plans, you have to let your team do the planning as much as possible. You have to take a step back so you can properly evaluate what are the risks to my team? What plans could we put in place to mitigate the risks that we can control? You can't mitigate every risk. Every decision you make is going to have some element of risk. Whether you're leading troops on the battlefield, whether you're making decisions in the business world, whether you're making decisions for your family or within your community, there's always some element of risk. Why? Because we don't know the outcome. We don't have a crystal ball. We don't know the future. But you have to make the best decisions you can based on the information that you have. One way to do that is to take small steps in the direction that seems right. We call this iterative decision making. What's the smallest step that I can take in the direction that seems best? Then I can reevaluate that decision and make adjustments to my plan as necessary. And that is one way that we can actually be decisive and be aggressive and make decisions that move the team forward in a positive direction, but also mitigate the risks that we can control. Either way, as a leader, you're going to have to make decisions that carry some element of risk, and you have to be comfortable with that. You have to accept that, but you have to balance moving fast, seizing an initiative, making things happen, taking advantage of opportunities that your opponent or your competitor provides you. And you have to balance that by mitigating the risk that you can control, staying detached, and, and thinking what is the smallest decision that I can make in the direction that seems right based on the information that I have at the time. You have to balance between being default aggressive but not being reckless. And when you can find the proper balance between these two opposing forces, you are going to be able to lead yourself and lead your team to victory.